So my name is Michael Scott. I work for a company called Foundries IO. Uh, it's kind of a think of it as an easy button for product developers to kind of get a head start in the embedded development space. They can bring their own uh, hardware, software, and we provide a lot of the sort of CI test loop security infrastructure like that. You would have to hire several engineers to provide. My talk today is going to center around AT-based modems and their integration into the Zephyr RTOS. Um, we're going to start with what's there currently, what was there prior to current. Um, the stuff that mainly we're focusing on is going to be released with the 2.0 release. Uh, just to show of hands, who's familiar with Zephyr? All right, good, good. Who's familiar with AT-based modems? Oh, yeah, that's painful. All right. Um, so without further ado, we're going to talk about several things here, and I'm going to try to get through it so we save some time at the end to kind of talk about your particular questions or something you might be interested in. So I'm going to start with a survey, like we'll kind of cover the basics of the networking stack in Zephyr. Um, two key features there in how they offload data that comes into that stack, because that's where modems kind of come in. You don't want to use all of the underpinnings of stuff that are already provided by the modems. Um, we're also going to cover what was the original uh, modem implementation with Zephyr 114 and how we've changed it for Zephyr 2.0 coming up here. I think it's going to be released August 30th. The, um, we're going to talk about that new implementation has several components, why we did it that way, uh, what we hope to gain, and how we hope to kind of ramp that out in the future. Uh, then we're going to talk about which modems are currently covered by Zephyr uh, as far as either in the mainline or a mainline-based SDK, uh, as well as uh, modems that are in products that are currently either going to be shipped soon or out there. And then we're going to talk about what comes next, and we'll take some questions. So before we begin, I'm going to tell a little story because I'm always fascinated as to how people get involved with various projects and why they come up with the idea to actually submit something like a modem layer or some helper driver for something like Zephyr. And for me, uh, my engineering manager came to me one day and said, you know, this uh, AT&T modem thing that happened to be a shield, it, it kind of went on an NXP part. He said, that thing looks really cool. This LTE M, NBIOT, this thing looks really neat. We need to investigate it and see if it's something that we can sort of present as options for our products. And so I downloaded the software, and I, uh, I think it was EmbedOS or one of those other ones, not to throw anybody under the bus, but Every single sample that I went to load had the entire modem driver and was totally customized to do that one thing. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. What if I want to do MQTT or LWM to M or all these other things? I've got to like magically put together all these pieces and craft this thing. And I think it came down to the fact that they didn't have a central way of taking the network stack and kind of intercepting it with the driver and leaving that as sort of core to Embed OS. And so I started thinking I was already um, an implementer. Uh, I had brought in the LWM to M subsystem for Zephyr, and I was thinking to myself, well, maybe we could do something. This is, you know, maybe we could submit something that would kind of make life better and maybe unify it a little bit and see what we can get. And so that was my start in the Zephyr modem layer. And um, just to highlight the network stack here, you can kind of see how samples live on the very top. They access most of the protocol layers directly, so you can like initialize MQTT, you can start the LWM tem, you know, sort of client, and then those protocol layers actually act through the sockets layer that's been implemented fairly recently, down through the network context layers, and you get into the core of the TCP IP UDP down onto the actual hardware type driver, whether it's Ethernet, 802.15.4, BLE6, low pan, et cetera. Now, I highlighted two options on the right there, and these are called offloaded APIs. And so, for instance, um, what you're seeing a lot lately is that on the NCP, the network, you know, whatever it is, if it's a um, Wi-Fi or an AT-based modem, they do that stack for you. So you don't necessarily want to let a lot of that stuff go down into this lower layer because you're just going to hand it off to the modem and make a call, and it's going to give you a response, and that's going to be the end of it. So they have two different methods of, so of offloading that data. One is at the top you have a socket-based offload API, and on the bottom you have sort of this net offloaded API. Um, and we're going to cover those in just a little bit of detail once we talk about how the original implementation was done versus the new one. So here is how the modem implementation looked in 114. You've kind of got the net offloaded APIs on the left. That's where the injection, so we intercept our calls for like send, receive, connect, those sort of basic network calls. And you've got sort of the core modem driver in the middle managing everything. And then you have like 
your hardware is on the right. You're writing the pins, you're reading off of, say, like the GPIOs or, you know, UART to get responses. And then you can see how this it happens to be a Sarah R4 modem driver utilizes its own command parser to take that data, parse it up, and then do something on it. And what you ended up with um, is kind of a driver that does everything. It's very hard for people to say, hey, where can I contribute? Oh, I noticed you got a bug in your command parser. Do you submit it to each driver? Is it, it just gets messy. Because in the, in the beginning, I think I talk about this a little later, but uh, it was really only one or two drivers. And so it's not really very scalable or sustainable as far as like really growing that subsystem. So what we did was we kind of rearranged things. Um, this is sort of the new model for 2.0. At the heart of everything is something called a modem context driver. And this is a helper layer that just sort of keeps the public shareable portions of the modem functions, read, write, processing, um, and it's able to share that out with some of the other subsystems. Right now, it really only works with sort of the modem shell, so you can actually send commands to the modem, but it doesn't know anything about that modem other than the fact that it exists, it has an ID number, and this is a command I can, this is an API I can send a command to. Um, everything else happens kind of under the wheels. So you'll notice that um, in this other version, we use the net offload here. That's actually been changed. We now use the socket offload, and I'll cover those APIs and why we made that choice. Um, not only does the, uh, well, we'll talk about it in a sec, but you'll also see that the, sock, the, the actual modem driver is kind of off to the left here. The, the main goal for the modem driver now is to configure everything underneath that modem context, hand it off, and just get callbacks. Whether as commands come in, they get handled. Um, there's a lot of surface area where the community can contribute. And you'll notice that those sort of four things around the center uh, off of the modem context are really what we're gonna be focusing today. We have, there's like modem socket kind of abstraction. There's modem pins. We've got the command parser. And then hopefully power control, which would get into like EDRX or low power modes on the modems in the future. Because that's really what um, I think is most interesting right now is if you're gonna use a low bandwidth uh, low resource usage modem, you kind of want to put it in the lowest power mode you can. Uh, turns out we didn't quite get to everything. So, you know, um, the modem pins and sockets aren't really attached very well to the context. So in this first version that I'm going to talk about, that's kind of what it looks like right now. Um, they really are just bolt-ons onto the driver. They set them up. Um, we're going to probably move more and more into the center and hopefully get a better, better look there. Uh, but we are, we are moving forward and hopefully it'll be better for con contributions and everything. Next thing I'm gonna talk about is this um, concept of offloaded APIs. And what I wanted to kind of start with is this, is this is the past. This is the kind of access you had in these net offload APIs. You had things like get, bind, listen, connect, accept, send, receive. These are very basic network commands. They don't give you access to much else. And the kind of other things that we're talking about, I'll cover in a sec, but they also used kind of these cryptic uh, parameters. So it's, it's a net context, and it's, uh, you had to have like this net packet structure that you passed in, and that thing's like a linked list of buffers. It all made for very bloated drivers, very hard to handle. Iterating through these things and trying to sort it was really kind of a pain in the butt. Um, this is where we move to the socket APIs. So this is a POSIX-based, I don't want to say it's compliant because that's a little, kind of a wiggly word, but um, you'll notice that if the functions that are offloaded, you actually have kind of some interesting other options. In a lot of modems or AT-based command sets, they provide things like TLS setup uh, or DNS calls, or these are things like before you even make a connection, you actually want to do something, whereas in the other layer, you almost couldn't do it. And so it was really frustrating at times for, to implement certain modems. Um, the thing you're handing around is not some cryptic net context, it's just a file descriptor, just like any other POSIX system. You hand that thing off and it, it just makes sense when it enters and leaves the modem driver. That you, you turn around and hand that off to all of these offloaded APIs and everything kind of stays in sync. The kind of network data that you're handing around is just buffers. These are just char pointers, they're very easy to handle, there's no sort of iteration through linked lists or trying to do funky allocation and, and uh, freeing up of all this stuff. And so I think this is actually gonna simplify the drivers over time, you're gonna get a lot less bugs. Um, and in many cases, you might even be able to port existing code because of the way it's sort of POSIX you know, based. Um, the other thing I noticed is a lot of these um, AT-based command modems really try to mimic the socket sort of workflow. So when you create a uh, connection, it gives you kind of a number back and that's your socket number. And then every time you write to that connection, you gotta reference that number. And, and it's, it's a lot like using sockets, so it just mirrored that that workflow a lot better. 
Um, we're going to talk about like what what the original idea of having a modem helper layer was. Um, what the heck is a modem receiver? This is like the first thing that got submitted with the first modem driver, and it was done back in August of 2018, way, way back. That was ancient for Zephyr. Um, and it was submitted along the time, uh, the very first modem driver that I did for that Wistron modem that we got from AT&T. It's just very simple. It's a tight loop. It, uh, it handles an ISR. It offloads the data off the UART as fast as it possibly can into kind of a thread-safe ring buffer. And then what, it's up to the modem driver to call back in and say, hey, do you have more data? When he has time, can I just receive something? And if nothing's there, fine, move on. If so, I'll grab it. And then basically, once the modem driver got that data, it was kind of all, everything else was handled in the driver. Um, everything was about the modem receiver was very UART specific. It didn't allow much um, abstraction. Like it, it, you had public and private data. There's semaphores in there. It's all kind of messed up. And unfortunately, now that has to live in there a while because there are other drivers that are using it. So now we have our problem. I want to submit a new driver. Maybe I uh, want to change that implementation a little bit. Um, the community started kind of like, hey, how would I do this? And, and maybe my thing needs to be tweaked a little. And I realized we kind of have a problem. Nowhere to land bug fixes. Um, it's confusing as far as like, what if I want to change a parser? Do I like, you know, copy paste everything? How do I set up a new one? Um, there really was no future with that system. So we, uh, let's do something better. Uh, earlier this month, I actually finalized the, contr the contribution that landed in Zephyr for 2.0. Um, and it centers around this, con this concept of a modem context. You're taking a series of these underlying objects, you're configuring them, you have several different implementations. They have both public and private um, structures there. So in a modem context, it's what's public. So you get a basic uh, read and write abstraction for the modem interface. You have a really basic process abstraction for once you get that data, you hand it off to your command parser. And then you have some kind of helper layers in the pin config. And that's where I was talking about pin config, meh. It's not really, we're getting there. It'll be better and better. Um, basically what that did was it stopped all this boiler code from people having to import the GPIO layer and do all these other things. It, it just makes it a little easier. Um, and then when you compare the new modem interface with what was the modem receiver, the, the biggest thing was what happens if we don't have a UART-based modem? What, how, do, how would we treat that, right? So if you have the public read and write APIs and you leave the private data up to each implementation, then you have the option of adding more, and that allows the community to sort of really go crazy on it. The first implementation is clearly a UART-based implementation. So all it does is assigns itself the read and write functions. It has all of its own private little semaphore ring buffer. It's very similar to what was the, the modem receiver, but it allows other things to kind of coexist. And um, what happens, as the modem drivers kind of get more fledged, you know, fully fledged, it's almost going to be like a buffet table of mix and match objects here. And as I described the other parts, you have to imagine I'm writing a modem driver. I'm going to take that piece, that piece, and that piece. I'm going to link them all up to the modem context and hand it off now. And everything just runs. Um, we'll talk about this, uh, the idea of centralizing like command parsing and what it actually is. The, um, it's really tricky when you get into AT modems. You've got to deal with these carriage returns. And, and so you're sending a command, and you kind of need to wait for the right response. And so when, when, we, when I sat down and I tried to abstract this out, and I wanted to make sure this is something the community could kind of help, I came up with that sort of generic sort of process. Um, so what, at its heart, every driver has kind of a receive loop. And once they get data back from the interface, they just hand it off to the command parser that they've chosen. The initial command parser deals with very straightforward AT-based commands. It uses carriage returns. Um, but it does a lot of nice things. It, um, and I'll get into how does this look. Um, basically, there's a define called modem command define, which is basically establishing this is going to be a callback. Um, you then create three kinds of responses. So one response is a generic response. It's a OK, I had an error, something, maybe even an extended error. Um, and that's what I'm defining right here in the response commands. And then you have unsolicited commands. These are like, hey, there's some data ready to read. Or, hey, you're now registered on the network. Or these are kind of things that you can't expect or wait for. And then there's a third kind of response. That's the response to the command you're actually sending at the moment. And that's the one you're actually waiting on. So in a way, you can handle your unsolicited, 
The, I call the, the response commands at the top kind of, those are the enders. Those are the ones that say, yep, I got what I wanted. Hopefully in the middle you were able to get some data out of that and use it um, because that's what triggers their, say for instance, you're gonna send a command to read the manufacturer data. Um, in the middle of that, you're gonna get that manufacturer data. It's gonna hit the command callback and then it's gonna hit the okay. And the okay says, give up the semaphore, let's move on, We've, that command has been successful or it had an error. Um, you'll notice that there's some interesting parameters here. Um, the modem define defines the handler. The modem command itself matches what it's looking for with how many parameters you're gonna get back from it and what the delimiter is. And that's why you're seeing like this string of, um, of data there. And what that does is it actually handies kind of like an argv pointer, an array of, uh, array of strings back. So you don't have to sit there and iterate through that data looking for things. If you have your right delimiter, you get the right array of commands that you're looking for. You just grab it and copy it. It actually chews up a lot of the boilerplate that was ending up in the modem drivers that each one was implementing specifically. This is, um, I'm just gonna talk about the config helper a little bit because every modem seems to have like a power, a reset, or some kind of generic, you can, sometimes there are GPOs to put it in low power mode. Um, what I found was a lot of people had a lot of different code in there doing different ways to control the modem. Uh, and what I found was we want to encourage the right behavior. So in the example that I'm, the one that we set up for this first iteration, um, we use DTS and so the DTS portion here is actually coming from the binding. It's set up for that modem. It generates this sort of standard define, and that's ending up with like your controller number, the pin number, flags potentially. You put that in a nice big array. You can use it in, you know, like in a num, and then you can make generic modem pin writes. You turn things on, turn things off. If you have to wait for an interrupt, it could get a little more complicated, but at least this means you didn't have to like, you know, deal with all the GPIO stuff that, that you end up setting up in, uh, in Zephyr. Am I going too quick? No, good, all right. Um, let's talk about what those socket offload APIs look like um, in, in actual code. And so um, remember how I said you get, these are sort of POSIX based. You have a socket call which allocates the FD. You've got a socket close where you pass the FD back and you're giving it up. These actually end up as functions with sort of these parameters where you then translate that into the AT modem command. And so in some point you're probably, you know, you're busting out that text back going, okay, here's my, you know, you create sock, whatever. It seems like every modem has a different set of commands to manage this part of it. There's no three GPP standard for all the socket based, you know, network communication. But then what you do is you assign those functions to this offload structure, and you do have to register it at the bottom there. So somewhere in your modem init, you're gonna call register. It then says, ah, I need to intercept all this stuff, and instead of pushing it down the stack, I can deliver it over here. And it's actually really cool. You can turn off the stack at that point, and it makes your code size small. It's, um, it's kind of neat that you can actually put these modems on very, very tiny devices. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is how to get started. I know a lot of people um, on Slack and on IRC have, have like, I'm, I'm confused, you know, I know I could probably build this modem driver and I could connect it right up to your LWM time client and that would be great, but I mean, I wanna do that. I, I don't want this thing to all of a sudden try to get and receive data. I wanna sit and maybe just tinker with it a little bit. And so here's some helpful, tents, uh, helpful tips. You're gonna have to get your AT command reference, first of all, and get real familiar with it especially the networking portions of it, how to create a socket, how to send data, do you have limits on that data, does it need to be hex encoded, all that sort of stuff you're gonna have to know. The next part is really get familiar with the Sarah R4 modem uh, driver. That's the first modem driver that really uses this modem context setup. Um, there's, there's not gonna be much that you can copy and paste from it, but you can certainly set your driver up the same way as far as here's your handlers, here's how you squash them down into an array and hand them off. Um, that driver is probably gonna get you on a good start. Here are some helpful config items. Um, I love to enable modem shell. I think it's a great way to play with the modem. And I, and I like to play the hello, so I'll compile the hello world uh, sample, which literally prints hello world and stops. But meanwhile, behind the scenes, the modem shell is still running. You can send AT commands, you can watch for responses, you can really play with the modem driver a little bit. And um, what I'm illustrating at the bottom here, if you're familiar with Zephyr and the West build system, you can actually tack on config items on the fly after the double hyphen. So I'm actually not running an overlay config to enable the modem, I'm literally just enabling the modem with all these commands. And you can do that with any sample in the, uh, in the, in the Zephyr you know, library. And there's a link to the uh, Sarah R4 modem. 
driver there at the bottom. So we're gonna step away from the technical stuff a little bit and we're gonna back up. So here is basic lists of just which modems are covered in Zephyr right now. Um, this is the original AT&T IoT starter kit. It's a wishdrawn modem. Uh, the AT commands are a little sketchy at times. There's a lot of workarounds. Um, I'm not recommending people necessarily jump into this one. If you already had some investment there, you might wanna take a look at this. The one thing I will point out is the first two are actually shields and you can, any piece of Zephyr that has Arduino headers and it has the DTS defined for them, these shields also have matching defines so that you can mate them via the Arduino headers and it will just work if you specify it in the shield parameter there. Um, we spent a lot of time really trying to abstract the shield layers out and I think um, you can really see the benefit on these. This one and the next one, this is the one I kind of like to toy with and I would recommend if somebody does want to jump in and have a good time with it. This one is a SparkFun product that they took a Sara R4 modem, they slapped it on our Arduino header. You only really have two pins plus the UARTs. Um, it's, it's very easy to play with. It doesn't matter whether you have a Nordic, you know, uh, dev kit that has Arduino headers. You could have the Freedom Board which has Arduino headers or you could have an SDM part that has Arduino headers. It'll pretty much work with almost anything as long as you get the DTS right. Actually, in, in this case, it's all taken for you. Um, this one in particular, if you literally run it for any of the networking samples, it should just work. If it doesn't, you know, it can hunt me down and you lied to me, I hate you. Um, this is an interesting one and I wanted to talk about this one a little bit. This is a brand new product from uh, Nordic or fairly new. It's a system on a package, uh, the 9160. Um, they use a Zephyr-based SDK. It's one of the first companies that actually has taken Zephyr, adapted it into their software development kit directly. They have all of their own samples written for this that are literally gonna work out of the box. It's, uh, it's a really neat, um, they're, they're lev really leveraging their SDK plus like really well-built net network samples. They have a uh, cloud-based connector. I helped them get the LWM Tem client up and working for this. It's kind of fun, uh, it's really neat. I mean, if you guys have worked on Nordic, uh, dev kits. This is just like a dev kit style, but with the with the modem part included. It doesn't have BLE or any of the other th any other things included, but it's that sort of same form factor. And the last one I'm talking. Uh, so this is not a modem that's actually supported in mainline. This is an actual product where they chose to implement it using Zephyr as the driver, and they hand that as the software piece out for people that are looking to customize the modem in some way or run some sort of custom software. I thought it was interesting because I communicated with this guy for quite a while. Um, on, on the current modem driver and how we were gonna make it better. And he was super excited. He was like, I'm not gonna touch that because we're gonna ship this thing and we're gonna get it out the door, but I wanna talk to you later. So I did wanna mention it. Um, hopefully he's gonna submit the actual driver to mainland Zephyr here pretty soon. Maybe it'll get in for 2.1. But this is an interesting, um, kind of an interesting product. And they're, they're, they're again, they're gonna hand Zephyr out as sort of the out of the box demo that you can code on this. So now that we've covered all that, what's next? Um, Clearly I had a couple of fibs in my uh, diagram there that we're gonna try to work on. We should really abstract that network layer, the socket-based connections, to, so it's easier. There's a lot of boilerplate stuff in there. It just doesn't need to be in the drivers. We need to move more and more into the context so that the, the hard work of building the driver that shouldn't be there isn't there. Um, we need to support the low power modes. One of the guys had a really interesting idea of actually being able to, one config, enable a bunch of standard 3GPP, um, like out of the box, modem commands, set up as handlers already. So like for instance, a lot of like reading the manufacturer data, the model, all of that stuff is set in stone, it's part of the standard, it just works, should just work. So if we were to have a 3GPP layer, you would actually cut your probably modem driver in half. All those handlers would just exist. Um, there's some other really interesting ideas of creating a new interface called a dummy, dummy interface. And then you would have a dummy modem driver and what you're doing there is you're feeding data in and making sure that you get the right responses from like command parsers or we would use it as more of like CI, make sure that we didn't break the modem layer. Uh, we need to work on that. There's some uh, storage configuration for like APN data and things like that. It would be neat if you could just bolt that on the bottom. If, I know a lot of modems have internal storage for that but if you wanted to do something special in Zephyr to kind of feed configurations into that, it would be interesting. And now we're open for drivers. I mean, it's more about um, as, as people get interested, you pick a driver and it's, it's not as hard as you might think. Once you get used to the code, it, uh, it should be easier. It could, now at least you have a place to post bugs. If you see a problem, you can actually post it on the mailing list or post it up on the, uh, on the Git site. And with that, I'm gonna open it to questions. Let's see if, um, does somebody have something specific as far as something you were interested in? Right here.
That's right. They have an add-on. It's interesting. I think it's AT-based uh, commands. So it w what would be fascinating for me is to someone that would pick the GPS module up, they do the add-on, and then perhaps write a, like a subset of commands to work with GPS, and then you can enable it via config. And it would almost work with any of the Sarah modules. This, the Sarah R4 module happens to work with the U2 uh, module as well, which was an interesting contribution. But that's a great idea, I think, is enabling GPS via that. Several of the modems have those type of add-ons as well, not just the Sarahs. Was there any other questions? Um, I don't. I, it really is, and as soon as you say, "Oh no, it's POSIX compliant," and then they'd be like, "Hey, wait a minute, you don't do this, and you don't handle this." So I, I hesitate to use, you know, POSIX compliant as a word. It is POSIX esque. It is, it, it is POSIX, and you should be very comfortable using those commands. They're going to give you a file descriptor. They're going to do the things they should do. Uh, I just didn't want to, you know, step on any. You can get into arguments real, real quick. It's almost as bad as tabs versus spaces once you step in the POSIX space. Absolutely, and it, it, there's code out there. And Zephyr has made a huge effort to become more and more POSIX compliant, and I think it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction because you're getting code reuse, you're not trying to reinvent the wheel, and there's so much, so many of the drivers are already out there, why not, why not leverage them? Um, it was more about implementing the reference. Well, you're correct um, uh, for the socket type stuff. Uh, actually, what I meant was um, the 3GPP has a standard set of AT commands that almost every modem implements. And so I felt it might be interesting if we had a layer that you could just turn on and it would automatically pre-query like, uh, what sort of, co like the, the, um, the ops that you're connected to, it might actually um, pre-configure sort of some of the passed in commands and stuff and automatically be able to query the manufacturer info, the, the software version, things like that. Um, it might, it, it gets a little weird when you're implementing the okay error parts that are so specific to your driver, depending on are you waiting on something back and things like that. But I thought it might actually reduce the size of the drivers quite a bit. But that was the 3GPP reference that I was talking about. I think the idea is that you're gonna clear it out anytime you do a receive call. So at that point, the driver's ready to handle data. The neat part is, so if you get into the details here, the implementations have their own buffer sizes. Um, so the ring buffer is one thing just to get the data off the UART, because it doesn't stay there forever. Um, and you, if you leave it on too long, you're generating ISRs, and so you wanna get out of that context very, very quickly. The driver needs to then have its own processing buffer that, that, that's specific to the command parser. And that can be oftentimes a lot bigger than the ring buffer because you might get half a, a, an AT command response, you might get a whole one, and whatever doesn't get processed in the current implementation actually gets left in there so that it gets picked up the next time. Um, but that's a, that's a great question. Like, uh, you know, every driver might need different size buffers, and that's why we allowed the driver itself to configure all of the sort of private data for each component, and then when it registers it with the modem context, it's sort of, um, it's accessible then, right? So the command buffer has several different configurable items, and it's something that we're gonna have to do a better job, I think, of documenting, but for now, you're gonna kinda have to look through the code and go, oh, there, there's that big fat receive buffer that, we, uh, that you want. And typically, it revolves around like the max length size. The, uh, in, in the particular, in the Sarah R4, I think it's 1024 is the max sort of receive size. And that's what you'll see in the buffer, is it reflects that. You have to, right? I, I love the fact that you brought this up because the idea behind splitting out a UART specific implementation for the interface was that you might encounter exactly that. There might be another way to get the data. And I, in my head, I was thinking, I don't know, spy or something, you know, crazy sort of implementation. But USB is actually a really great way and, um, because you do see that implemented on a lot of the modems. And if you have sort of that sort of uh, read and write 
methods that still apply, I don't know if they actually still apply when you get into USB, you might actually be doing more IOCTL type calls uh, in the Linux side. Maybe it does end up being like a send and receive. It's a read and write, it is a read. It's all a whole oh, so you get a, one, at, one at a time, you get packets. Okay, that, I love it, great. I, I would love to see somebody implement a USB uh, interface for this particular, because that would just open up a whole, a whole nother wave of like drivers. So uh, that just lets me know maybe we did the right thing. Uh, was there a specific, which uh, modem were you, you mentioned? Uh, well, like, that's the Sierra 758. Right. That's right. And, uh, we also use the uh, HPLC CD1 that's the same. It has both interfaces. And they actually have both have both interfaces. Did they make a recommendation on which one to use if you're going to have certain, for use, certain use cases? Uh, yeah. yeah. Some? It's usually the bands, too, that they support sometimes. Um, I was thinking, actually, I don't know how easy it is to do low power on USB. Um, sometimes it's harder with the teardown and the bring up. Sometimes they go, if you're going to do low power, recommend UART. It's easy to turn the UART like IP off in many cases. But that brings us to what's next. I mean, the things like, um, so I can tell you right now, there are about four modem drivers in, in works. Um, the one that I mentioned for the Pinnacle is the, is the one that's probably the closest. Uh, there was another modem driver written for, I think, one of the Qualcomm modems, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Hopefully, he gets that up and running pretty quickly. And there were two others where I think they mentioned it, but I may have forgotten. So we'll see how quickly the, they can adopt sort of, because I really wanted to see new submissions in using this. I don't want people to keep writing these sort of copy-paste drivers and really hard to manage. So we'll see how quickly they come up. But I think the more example drivers using this, it's actually going to get the snowball rolling. People are going to have an easier time implementing them, and, and there will be a lot of really good examples. But uh, I would love to see a USB implementation. Any other questions? All right. Well, with that, have a good afternoon.